Today, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Mark Galliati. Dr. Galliati is an honorary professor at UCL School of Slavonic and East European Studies and Ernest Bevin Associate Fellow in Euro-Atlantic Geopolitics with the Council on Geostrategy. Um, but he's uh, currently affiliated and has been affiliated with many more organizations, institutions, and so the list can go on. Um, Dr. Galliati has been researching and writing about Russia since the late 1980s, and he's widely published on issues in politics, crime, and security in Russia. Aside from his research, Dr. Galliati has also taught in his native UK, the United States, and Russia. His latest book is called The Weaponization of Everything, published by Yale University Press, where he looks at how conflicts today are fought with everything from disinformation and espionage to crime and subversion. Dr. Galliati is also the author of the blog In Moscow Shadows. The blog is accompanied by a podcast which goes by the same name. And if you haven't listened to it, I would highly recommend that you do. Um, I guess I can provide a link for that later on if you are all interested. Um, but better than a podcast, we have Dr. Galliati with us today to talk with us in person, uh, to offer insight and to, to answer our questions. So. Uh, without further ado, Dr. Galliati, the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much and delighted to be kind of here with you, even though, as is always the way these days, here largely means on a flat screen in front of you. So, yes, so I'll be talking uh, at the moment about the Siloviki, the, the various power agencies within Russia and their impact on politics, society and to a degree also national identity. What I'm going to do is aim to talk for about 45 minutes in terms of a sort of a lecture, and then we can throw it open to discussion, questions, and, and so forth. Um, the lecture will be associated with a PowerPoint, and I'll make sure that the organizers have the PowerPoint afterwards so that you don't need to take notes or whatever. Um, you'll have access to that as well. So let me just share my screen, and let's hope that the technology works. Okay, well, hopefully you can you can now see the um, the slide. So what I'm going to be doing is exactly talking about the, the CLV key, but it also is a question of how they link into these different aspects of when we talk about society. I mean, one is actually politics, obviously the high politics largely, but also the low politics on, on, on regions and such, right? But particularly the whole question of how far they, they shape or are shaped by Putin and the, sort of the, the handful of people around him who, of course, themselves are mainly with some kind of a security agency uh, background. More broadly, their impact on society as a whole, affecting you know, how people think about themselves, how people think about their nation, how people think about their state, which is different, and, and its place in the world. And that bleeds into this wider question of, of national identity, because it is clear that the security agencies and interests as a whole, but also particular individuals within it and particular institutions have in, engaged in a very conscious and deliberate attempt at identity building and identity shaping. So these are the sort of areas that I'll, I'll be covering because obviously, you know, it links in with, with, with that nice Mr. Putin um, and, and, you know, from his youth, even before he was in the KGB. Putin himself you know, was, was clearly interested. He was an enthusiastic follower of uh, sort of the uh, spy thrillers that the Soviet Union put out, particularly in 12 moments in spring. He said himself that uh, you know, what particularly interested him was the notion that if you were in the services, you know, one man could have an impact on how the whole world was shaped, which for better or largely for worse, one can say Putin has done. There's a man who, as you know, again, likely, likewise, very well known, when he was still at school, went to the KGB headquarters in, as was then Leningrad, the Bolshoi Dom, and actually said, well, how can I join? And one can only imagine just how bewildered the, the, the KGB people there were, because this is not a place that on the whole school kids turned up to. And basically said, run along, do your degree, and then who knows? And even then, he said, well, what degree should I do? I said, I don't know, law. And so he duly did law. And although one could argue he turned out to be a pretty mediocre KGB officer, I mean, he was a, he was a solid B. He was fine. But, you know, we have some of his attestations and, and reports, and it's clear that he was not a high flyer. 
But the point was that even if he was never a great spook, he was always a great spook fanboy. And if anything, he himself has been particularly fascinated by and I would, I would suggest sort of culturally colonized by the Siloviki themselves, which again is something that I'll be touching on. But who are these Siloviki, the so-called men of force, men of power, call them what you will? I mean, essentially, it's a, it's a very broad term, and I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit about the whole issues of, of labeling it. But for the, the people who have not just armed force, shall we say a kind of a broader concept of force, it ranges from, from the military, from various intelligence and security agencies, like, well, technically, it, it, it was for a long time it turned into the GU, the main directorate, but everyone still calls Russian military intelligence GRU, after it's so old. Um, title is the main intelligence directorate, the FSO, which is the Federal Guard Service, which provides the Kremlin guards, Putin's uh, array of black suited bodyguards and a whole variety of other services protecting key VIPs and government installations. The FSB, the Federal Security Service, in many ways sort of the primary successor to the KGB, the SVR, the Foreign Intelligence Service, but also a variety of other agencies, the Roskvardia, the National Guard, which is not like, say, the American National Guard, but essentially is a militarized internal security force that is also being used increasingly in external operations, whether we're talking Syria or whether we're talking Ukraine. And law enforcement agencies, such as the Interior Ministry, the MBD, Sklerkom, the Investigations Committee, which is the sort of, some people kind of parallel it to the FBI. It's not a very good parallel, but it's a more generally used one. And the Prosecutor General's Office, Gimprok. And so it, rain, it covers this whole spectrum from, from military to civil, from policing to security roles. And you know, we, we can, I think, sort of particularly sort of categorize it in three ways. The military is in its own category. Then we have the National Guard, the intelligence agencies, and the law enforcement services. And why I, I mentioned that is because it really is very important to, to stress that this is about a whole variety of different institutions which clearly will have their own ideas, their own ideals, their own operational cultures. Sometimes the other key is uh, sort of simply talked into as securocrats. In other words, security of officers who are involved in running the country. But it's not just that. It's yes, the security services, the military, and the police, but it's also often used to include veterans. And here we start to get into the very problematic issues of who counts as what? You know, does someone who used to be in the military count? And I would suggest that the answer is if they, if, use a current term, self-identify as such. Do they still feel particularly you know, in, engaged with the interests of the military, the culture of the military? Or do they just think, thank God, I've done that. I'm now, you know, I have a new life. And then there's also people who one could consider to be, shall I say, the cheerleaders of, of the services. So they're not actually people who are, who are ever really in them, but nonetheless choose to affiliate themselves with these services. And, and we see this, we see this in Parliament, we see this in the media, we see this in a whole variety of other places, of people who almost, um, I wouldn't say wannabe, because it's not as if they necessarily want to join these agencies, but they, they, they want to kind of align with them. They want to run with the same pack. So again, we're already talking about some, some quite blurred boundaries. And in particular, it's worth noting that, as I said, there's not one single Silovic identity. Always be careful when people talk about Siloviki and just glibly assume that there is some kind of single continuity between um, a lieutenant in the military who joined from Buryatia because he couldn't find any decent employment opportunities all the way through to a general in the Federal Security Service who is busy enriching himself hand over fist through corrupt use of his power and his intelligence resources. So there are multiple identities. It is distinctly fractured, as I'll, I'll talk later, often competitive. Um, people who, are, who we might call Siloviki and do not necessarily themselves identify as such, and in particular, there is a question of precisely, is it the case that once is Silovic, always is Silovic? And, and Igor Sechin, the, the charming looking gentleman um, pictured here, 
is a particularly good case in point. So many people have said that he is in some ways also the grey cardinal, some kind of grand convener or leader of the Siloviki. Why? Well, because if one tracks back his career, it seems, I mean, it's not been absolutely confirmed, but I think we can be, be pretty comfortable that he was indeed a GRU officer. Um, you know, in terms of his early career, he was a translator. He went to I mean, the, trans, the military translation school is one of the classic recruiting grounds for um, military intelligence officers and just generally his career trajectory and other evidence that we've seen very, very strongly suggests that. So, you know, Sitchin is often identified as a, a grand Silovic. However, I would say that and certainly anecdotally, in terms of my conversations with people who definitely are Silovic, they never see Sitchin as one of their own. Once, once upon a time, maybe, but now he's just a hydrocarbons baron. You know, he's, he's the head of, of, of Rosneft. He's operating somewhere in the political and economic stratosphere. There's absolutely no sense that Sechin in any way exerts himself, exerts his economic power, exerts his political muscle for the Siloviki as a whole. So we have to realize that people can move in and then move out of, of this, this particular sort of hazy identity. So this whole term, Siloviki, and um, there is a reason why I'm sort of dwelling a little bit on the kind of the epistemological side of things. It's something that requires, it's obviously, it is a self-identification. You know, there are people who say, we are the Siloviki, we are amongst the Siloviki, you know, who see themselves as being part of a security community. It's also a handy external identifier to lump together a whole variety of people who have certain similarities often in terms of their, their attitudes to, to Russia, its place in the world, the kind of instruments that are acceptable to use. And it's also just simply a, a handy label for when we're trying to you know, identify the different interests within the system as outsiders. So be aware of these different sort of terms. There is, I think, something that one could call a broad Silovic consensus, which I mean, like, like all consensus is, I mean, does not actually apply to every single individual. But broadly speaking, the people who regard themselves as Siloviki tend to feel that, and this is something that's been proven by opinion polls and, and, and various other means, that Russia is, is entitled to be considered a great power. Now, that's already causing issues. I mean, not just in terms of has, uh, encouraging a tendency to invade neighboring countries, but actually issues in terms of well, what, what does a great power mean? And very much, I would suggest that they take their cue from Vladimir Putin whose notions of what constitutes great power status are in many ways 19th century. You know, a great power has a sphere of influence. A great power has a voice and thus a veto on all key issues, regardless of whether its own interests are directly at stake. And the corollary of that, of course, is if you don't involve a great power, then it has a right to basically try and prevent you from resolving whatever issue it is. And finally, a great power is able to break the rules from time to time and get away with it. But somehow a great power is not totally outside the, the system, but nonetheless, it, it has a sort of a privileged position. So it's not about connectivity. It's not about soft power. It's not about all these much more 20th and more to point 21st century notions of power. It's a very traditional sense. And Russia is entitled to that, not simply because of its size or its nuclear arsenal or any other objective factor, but in some ways because of its history, that this is actually something that is a, a national birthright. And it's quite interesting how often people will fall back on things like the Great Patriotic War to say, well, you know, Russia has always been the defender of civilization, whether it was against the, the Mongols in the 14th century or Napoleon or now Hitler. You know, Russians fought and died for that, and that earned us, it bought us with our own blood, that status. Now, there is a lot that is problematic there. But I'm just simply re recounting that is often one of the key rationales. So it, it is a essentially something that Russia is owed rather than that is just simply because of something that Russia has. However, we in the West have been seeking to deny Russia that rightful status. And in the process, this is actually an act of hostility. This is trying to, in effect, steal something from Russia to which it is entitled.
and it's really part of a long-running political war. Again, there are varying sort of degrees to which people within the Silovic community will, will actually hold to this and regard the West as actively hostile. But broadly speaking, there is a, an overall assumption that by our refusal to grant Russia the attributes of great power status, we are being actively hostile. And in the face of that hostility, what is needed is a strong centralized state which is able to defend and advance Russia's interests. I mean, the state is absolutely central to their notion of, of, of what a great power is. And of course, that state has to have powerful and autonomous intelligence and security services. And I stress that autonomous. Um, there is that sense almost as if actually these agencies, these institutions are most powerful when they are least controlled. And again, <laughs> This is in many ways, I would suggest, an ideological rationale for what is just simply an institutional convenience. They like the fact of having minimal transparent, say, minimal oversight, the chance to often be deeply corrupt. Um, and, and they rationalize that as this also allows us to be most effective. Now, as I said, although there is this broad consensus, there are obviously major divisions as well. There are institutional interests. I mean, for example, the foreign intelligence service and military intelligence occupy you know, a fairly similar ecological niche and are often in direct competition. They're each trying to prove that they are the more effective, the more uh, ambitious service. The Federal Security Service is the largest individual and most powerful individual agency, the one after all which for a year Putin himself headed, um, you know, is constantly seeking to empire build. So at different times, it has actually engaged, found itself engaged in institutional turf conflicts with pretty much every other agency um, that we can talk about. There are factional interests that often cross-cut between institutions. I mean, for example, there was the infamous era of so-called Sechin Spetsnaz, who were elements largely within the FSB, who frankly were working for him rather than working for the FSB, or or they, they moonlighted anyway, but they, they used the FSB's powers and resources for Sechin's gain. But the interesting thing is, if you actually look at the wider array of the people who Sechin had suborned, they moved beyond just the FSB. There were people in SNEDCOM investigations committee. There were people within the police as well. And um, if you look at Ukraine, I mean, again, there it's interesting that there are different kinds of perspectives on precisely what should have happened and what should happen now in Ukraine. But again, cross-cut. It's not just simply the FSB thinks this and the military think that. It's that there are certain views. I mean, some people who, who do have a very maximalist view that basically say Russia should be mobilizing, Russia should do everything to basically bring all of Ukraine under its control at the cost of a huge national effort. And you'll see some people within the military, some people within the FSB, some people within Rosvardia and so forth supporting that. So they have a faction that is separate from others who say this is actually a pretty stupid war. We should be aiming for much more minimalist goals and try and end it as quickly as we can. But again, cross cut. Um, information security, there's a whole variety of other issues. When actually, when you drill down, you see that the factions do not actually specifically align with the institutions. And then there are just all kinds of different personal interests, particularly but not exclusively built around corruption and the formation of sort of charmed circles of, of, of groups of people who basically look after each other and mutually benefit. This chap, General Fyaptistov, was probably the sort of the, the leading figure within Sechin Spetsnaz. And on the one hand, he was working for Sechin. On the other hand, he was technically, he was a, an FSB officer. But also he clearly had his own personal interests, his own personal followership that was entirely separate. So this is where the, the consensus tends to break down is actually when, when you see a whole variety of, of different perspectives. But when we start thinking about, you know, are they influential, we, we really have to acknowledge the degree to which, while institutions clearly do matter within the Russian system, to a considerable extent, over the time, it has become increasingly monarchical. And, you know, the, the, the key decisions, the top level decisions are absolutely, they're the decisions of the court of Tsar Vladimir. And as a result, you know, actually the whole question of what does influence mean becomes an interesting and frankly sort of rather more sort of complex one than, than, than many people assume. You know, 
first of all, it raises, I mean, again, just as, as, as researchers and scholars, a whole variety of questions about, you know, what is influence and, and how can it be demonstrated? You know, what is the, the basis? All too often, people make very crude assumptions. Oh, well, again, let's take the invasion of Ukraine. You know, many people amongst the Siloviki wanted to see Ukraine brought to heel. And therefore, this is somehow a, a, a uh, reflection of Silovic influence. Well, often we don't know that. I mean, that might have just simply been convenient. It may well just simply have been unconnected. Can we actually draw a, a connection and say, look, this is how we can demonstrate that influence was specifically um, exerted? There are these ontological questions. Well, what are the security services? You know, are they, you know, once a Silovic, is it always one? If, if, you know, if, if, if Sechin manages to persuade Putin of something, is that a Silovic victory or not? Political one, you know, what are, what are the interests in play? They are not monolithic. Sometimes they are institutional, sometimes they are factional. Sometimes actually they are using influence on higher levels simply to play out lateral conflicts with, with other agencies. And then there's a final issue, which is obviously these are often services which are directly security agencies, and therefore much of what they say and do is covered in, in, in secret, it, it is shrouded in mystery, and a very, very thick um, patina of myth. I mean, I don't know if anyone, for example, follows that there is a telegram channel called uh, SVR General, which is, you know, claims to be the, the inside gossip from a senior general within the Foreign Intelligence Service. It is absolute conspiracy theory nonsense. Um, in part, sometimes the things it, it recounts are, are accurate because their stuff is well known, but there's all kinds of weird and bizarre gossip. Um, truly surreal at times. And yet one will find more journalists and scholars, I'm glad to say, but nonetheless, some people using this as if they just simply will. It comes from an SVR general. No, there is a difference between that and someone who says they are an SVR general. So often we, we do have problems in terms of lining up sources and you know, one tries to triangulate, but it's not often possible. What kind of influence can be exerted? Well, I'd suggest broadly speaking, there are three different types within a system such as contemporary Russians. First of all, it's capacity to the capacity of these various agencies and institutions to change the facts on the ground. So they don't so much directly influence the people who make the final decisions themselves. Rather, they change the situation to which the decision makers are responding. So if, for example, and again, you know, one, if one looks at Ukraine, one can look at what happened in 2014. And particularly, there's a very good book that's going to be coming out in uh, next month called Hybrid Warriors. Um, that very much unpicks actually the kind of process that took place. And what's clear is that it's not actually that the initial Donbass conflict was created because Putin said, start me a civil war in the Donbass. But that a variety of actors, some acting on their own initiative, some from within the security apparatus, but basically you know, for their own reasons, wanted to create a situation and encouraged and armed and initiated did all kinds of different things to sort of basically build up this insurrection to the point at which the Kremlin, which initially had in some way to simply exercise a degree of benign neglect and been willing to just see what happens, finds itself unable not to intervene. And therefore by August, 2014, it's actually deploying battalion tactical groups in support of the rebels because it, feels that it can't let the government defeat the insurrection. And from that point, this simply becomes a, you know, however deniable, but nonetheless, you know, a, a Russian intervention into, into Ukraine. And that said, that was because in some ways Putin was presented with a situation to which he had to respond and it encouraged him to respond in a certain way. Secondly, it is painting a picture, and this is a fascinating area of what we could call conceptual dominance. Again, I'll focus on Putin. It's not just about Putin, but you know, given that he is clearly the most important decision maker, we'll stress him. Um, you know, he is absolutely in a position to make whatever decisions he wants. However, those people who get to shape his notion of what the situation is, 
and what the options at his disposal are and what the likely outcomes of using those options would be actually do have a considerable degree of informal and indirect power. You know, if you are told that you know, there is a crisis and it's in Ukraine and you know, our best view is that the Americans were behind the revolution of dignity, the Euromaidan, and we believe that they want to create NATO bases, which could then be used to, to strike um, Russia, and we believe that, in fact, one could easily and quickly assert Russian dominance over Ukraine. But it's up to you, boss. It's a very different situation from when you're saying, look, the, you know, the, the revolution of dignity was essentially, you know, although the Americans were happy with it, essentially it was a domestic rising against a corrupt and unresponsive government. And that, in fact, you know, although the Ukrainians are very happy to pally up with the, with the Europeans and, and the Americans, there is no great enthusiasm and there's you know, no real prospect of their being brought into NATO. And yet, if we intervened, the Ukrainians would fight very hard. But the decision is yours, boss. You have created two very, very different uh, contexts in which the decisions will be made. Now, look, I mean, I, I, I painted these two as caricatures. But the point is, well, you know, what has become increasingly clear is the degree to which the Siloviki actually have a very, very powerful grip on the briefing process. And I'll come to that in, in, in a minute. Of actually the information that gets onto Putin's desk, the people who get to talk to Putin, people who get to shape his view of the world, disproportionately come from or are influenced by the Siloviki. And in the process, other voices, such as particularly the foreign ministry, when it comes to international affairs, have been squeezed out. So as I said, there is a powerful conceptual dominance there. And finally, as I mentioned, they also have influence in terms of lateral disputes in which the agencies seek to either co-opt powers from above or actually ignore and um, marginalize them while they resolve their own sort of uh, you know, lateral conflicts. So influencing the boss directly, let's talk a bit about that. Now, in theory, there is a competitive intelligence model that um, obtains within the Russian system, which is actually therefore that the different agencies all brief Putin and other decision makers separately. There is no single consensual view. And the idea is that therefore, there is less chance of being um, snow, you know, basically um, snowed over by um, a single manufactured Silovic consensus. And the classic example is the, the so-called the three briefing books. You know, every morning, well, or every afternoon, Putin's not the earliest of risers, but anyway, every day, for about one, one of the first official duties Putin has is he's given these three briefing books. There is one from the Federal Security Service about the domestic situation within the country. There is one from the Foreign Intelligence Service about the international situation. And then there is one from the Federal Protection Service, which is really about the situation within the elite inside Russia. And, and the crucial thing is that, in a way, these have become the... Um, basically the foundational documents that shape Putin's vision of what's going on for the rest of the day. And I must admit, you know, I, I've, I've talked to, uh, for example, you know, foreign ministry staff as diplomats um, who bitterly resent the fact that when their perspectives are different from the foreign intelligence services, instead of Putin weighing the two, he will tend to just simply assume that the SVR have had the right of it. And that the, the you know the poor naive diplomats just simply don't understand what what's really going on. So you know that's very much it's an early way in which you know on a day by day basis, Putin's view of the world domestically and internationally is being shaped. Then of course there are direct briefings from the various agencies. I mean in terms of the military intelligence, it comes through the general staff or the defence minister Sergei Shoigu. And over all of this, who exerts scrutiny? Well, it's, it's, it's obvious, the Security Council. But the Security Council, that really means Nikolai Patrushev, who, I mean, I, I, I called him in my podcast, the most dangerous man in Russia. I mean, I do feel he is the sort of the, 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 the hawk's hawk. And a man who, again, has been pushing a very, very aggressive conspiratorial agenda for what's going on in, in Russia and actively seeks to exclude briefings and sources of information 
that would challenge that particular perspective. Now, how does this actually play out in, in fact? I mean, I, I won't, I've, I've talked about that really. Well, this is, for example, um, this is from 2019 in order to sort of factor out the, the sort of the COVID factor and so forth. And it's a, a, an assessment, of, it's a breakdown of the, um, the meetings that were held with Putin um, on a, an individual or small group basis. So in other words, not like, you know, big security council meetings where, where everyone might be there, but where actually individuals get the chance to basically assert their, their, their influence over Putin himself. As you can see, Nikolai Patrushev, Secretary of the Security Council, who is, after all, the closest thing there is to a national security advisor. 29% of the sort of security-related ones, Shoigu, 23%, Portnikov, the head of the FSB, 17%, and so forth. You know, it, again, it, it gives us a sense of, of who actually has an influence. But this is within the actual realms of the security world. Let's talk more, more briefly about, uh, more, more sort of generally about how the information gets to the president. Well, let's say the interesting thing is the degree to which you actually have a whole variety of different avenues that are used to, to shape the president's view of the world. There's the direct briefing from the services. There are all the various documents, uh, the briefing papers, and, and so the analyses, which then are filtered through both the Security Council um, Secretariat and the wider presidential administration. Uh, but then there's also the fact that these agencies themselves seek to influence a whole variety of other informal sort of routes through the media, think tanks, business, you know, even the people who actually get to meet Putin socially tend to be sort of people from his old 1990s and Petersburg days and such like. They themselves get briefed and lobbied to try and bring them in to create a sense of a false consensus. I mean, for example, let's if we look at think tanks, one of the fascinating things is the Security Council well, the presidential administration as a whole is the single greatest consumer of think tank, or as in you know, orderer of think tank reports um, across, across the country. Security Council has a disproportionately large number of them. And what we see is actually these tend to be reports that are written to order. In other words, they are not, um, as one would hope in the West, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, um, a case in which, let's say, you know, a particular think tank is engaged to provide a report on, on a topic and just says, well, you know, we're interested in what we should be doing about Afghanistan. Tell us your views. No, it's we want a report from you about why America is trying to, you know, I'm just picking this a random example, you know, America is trying to penetrate Afghanistan to turn it against us and why we should therefore be talking to the Taliban much more assiduously. In other words, you know, again, it, it's about creating this appearance within the media and within think tanks and other circles that, in fact, there is a single obvious consensus, whereas, in fact, it is a often artificially created one. And that can be done because actually they have colonized a whole variety of key positions. This is, I mean, key positions is defined as, and again, I, I can always provide the uh, more, more, more specific parameters later if people want. But you know, looking at what, what we would think of as about the 50 key jobs within um, the country, within the state apparatus, sorry. Um, you know, so these are ministers, key deputy ministers, particular other officials, um, based on a variety of different surveys of you know, who, who matters within the Russian system. And this is a specifically a proportion of who, people who come from the, risk, the, the Russian intelligence and security community. So not the military, not the National Guard, but the basically the various spook and security agencies. Now, as a whole, 24% of all of these key officials actually have some kind of intelligence background or, or, or our current intelligence officers. And that's really quite significant. So almost a quarter of all the officials. But the, what the orange line shows are people who are specifically in security and international relations related jobs. And there we see 57% of them have some kind of current or former connection. Now, again, as I said, the former connection doesn't always mean that they, they are affiliated with a Sidovic line, but nonetheless, it is, I would suggest, quite indicative. And this one, this chart, what this shows is, again, particularly relevant elements within the presidential administration's departments who have, again, current or former security backgrounds. 
within the Security Council Secretariat, which is in a way where you'd expect 63%. I mean, that's, that's no great surprise. A lot of the people here, either they came from the, the military or the intelligence agencies, or they are, they are secondees. But then we have 28% in the Presidential Administration's Foreign Affairs um, Directorate, um, which, well, I mean, that, 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 that's quite significant, um, given this is really meant to be a bastion of the Foreign Ministry. Um, then we have the Experts Directorate, 19% knowing. But then this, OMKSZS, that this is the directorate for relations with compatriots outside of Russia. So it's for, it, it's for cultural and political connections with, with the wider Russian diaspora and, and other outside communities. This is essentially the presidential administration's political warfare directorate. The one that seeks to mobilize communities um, outside of Russia in support of Kremlin policies and so forth. 71% of, of its, uh, you know, basically sort of, you know, managerial staff have some kind of intelligence background. These figures, I mean, should treat them with a little bit of caution. It, it's based on interviews and assessments and, and some published information. I would regard the figures as quite soft. So don't take the exact number as, as, as absolutely read. But on the other hand, um, you know, it, it gives a sense of the proportions. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll skip the last one, OPS. And so again, you know, what we see is, is the degree to which actually more and more, and, and the, the shares have generally grown, more and more these agencies have come to dominate those people whose job is precisely to shape the president's worldview. But what I will say is, I mean, if, so, so, you know, let's talk about the impacts of this. Um, you know, there is this idea that uh, was obviously proposed by the Siloviki themselves, that they represent some kind of new nobility, it's a term that Patrushe very much likes using. Um, that in fact, you know, the, the aristocracy of, of, the mod, of modern Russia comes from the security and, and generally the Siloviki agencies. And that this has been reflected in the country itself, which has become this kind of new Sparta, one in which actually it is militarized and mobilized, not purely by actions from above, but by enthusiastic participation from below. But in other words, the Siloviki have managed, the idea goes, to have shaped Russians' own concept of themselves and of their country. Well, let's, let's look into that. I mean, first of all, you know, if, if we talk about the sort of new nobility, this comes from a, a, a Levada survey in August 2021, Levada still being absolutely the best and most independent of the various polling agencies that still miraculously uh, operates in Russia. And, and this is basically about you know, levels of, of you know, esteem um, of, of different institutions. And the army then um, comes up very much as the highest, 61%, the, the, the presidency, 53%, the FSB, 45%. And then we go down, and you know, if you want to go down to things like um, you know, unions, 20% at the bottom, political parties, right at the bottom, 17%. So this would seem to suggest uh, a kind of degree to which actually Russians have imbued, you know, accepted a certain sense of this kind of positioning of themselves as, as being the, the sort of the honest and forthright and above all dependable, um, you know, institutions that hold the country together. And it's certainly something that, that different Silovic agencies have sought to, to, to develop and further in different ways. Um, I mean, the military, for example, has been, you know, especially deciduous on this. Shuigu, whether he understands much about military affairs kind of remains to be seen. But on the other hand, he absolutely un understands PR and particularly positioning of institutions. I mean, he did a brilliant job with the Ministry of Emergency Situations, frankly, both institutionally and also in terms of its uh, reputation. But he's also, you know, or had also, certainly until February, done a great deal also with, with the military, with all kinds of different things like these, the army games, um, a deeply surreal, but really quite fascinating kind of regular series of competitions. You imagine military Olympics, um, people around the world coming in, sort of coming in basically doing things like tank biathlon and such like, um, close institutional ties with the Russian Orthodox Church, in many ways are sort of best exemplified um, by the, the sort of bizarre, khaki cathedral of the military 
um, outside the Park Patriot kind of military theme park um, on the outskirts of Moscow. The Yunarmia, um, a, a militarized youth wing, which you know, provides not just snappy uniforms and red berets, but a whole variety of different actually sort of often quite appealing experiences for, for young Russians. Yes, you, 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 you march and you have to spend some time standing at attention outside war memorials and things like that. But on the other hand, you also get to do cool things like, like you know, jump out of a plane, presumably with a parachute, um, you know, drive a tank, shoot things, do radio electronics or whatever. All the kind of things which, again, back in, in the day, things like the sort of scouting movement also did. But, but as I said, very much militarized and used as a vessel for bringing the propaganda that suits the particular institution to bear onto a, a growing cohort of, of young Russians. The military are particularly good at this. They're not exclusive. I mean, the FSB also has a whole, I mean, it's a, a book, FSB Protiv. Um, there is a whole body of, of not just sort of film and TV, but also literature, uh, not just about the FSB, but supported by the FSB. So much so that they actually have their own annual literary prize for the book that they think uh, on the author that they think best exemplifies FSB values. And when we talk about FSB values, we're not talking about corruption and, rep and repression. We're talking about the values about the FSB that, that it wants to present to the outside world. So, you know, th 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 this, there is a very clear and very deliberate attempt to try and shape not just Russians' perspective of the institutions, but Russians' perspectives about themselves and their country. And to fit it into this wider, you know, artfully created historical narrative of, of Russian heroism as a nation and the degree to which you know, it, that is connected to the fact that the outside world is consistently unreliable and dangerous. And that Russia is only safe when it is unified, when it is disciplined, and when it has a single um, you know, decision making body that relies clearly upon the Silobiki. And, you know, for, for a sort of a classic um, and, and obvious example of this attempt to create a sort of a grand historical sort of narrative that connects all these things, here we have the, uh, the fabled victory flag, which is the flag, or a replica, obviously, of the flag that was hoisted over um, Berlin at the end, you know, at the end of, of World War II, but in being shown in the Sichansk, um, which had recently been captured from the Ukrainians. Um, so again, you know, trying to not particularly subtly often draw direct comparisons between current conflicts and a largely mythologized era of national triumph through extreme adversity. However, all that said, the interesting thing is we also can see distinct limitations. Military service is not particularly popular um, amongst you know, Russians. Draft dodging is, is much lower than it was, um, but, but nonetheless, there is clearly a constant need to massage the truths about what it means. And this is a, a, an interesting little sort of survey, uh, again, fr from 2020, you know, of, of Moscow students. And again, Moscow students, um, this, this is students who are um, 18 years and over, so it wasn't just university, but also technical academies and such like. Um, you know, of them, 18.4% felt that military service was, was a promising field, which was kind of, it was all right. But on the other hand, how many actually plan to join the military? Well, just 0.7%. Um, you know, actually, this, this is not a particularly sort of, uh, you know, prestigious area still. You can appreciate the military conceptually without actually liking the idea of it. And it also, it, you know, this is something, you know, FSB officers do complain about the fact that they feel under low public esteem, the poor dears, um, you know, not least because there is well-known high levels of corruption and impunity amongst them. And although the, the, the goal is in some ways to convince Russians that foreign military adventures may well be a necessary, indeed desirable thing for the, not just the protection of the state, but as a reflection of the, the virility and power of the state, but nonetheless, in order to basically maintain some degree of public support for them, they have to be lied about. And that applies whether we're talking about the, the conflict in the Donbass, where sort of 
And that's, that's the wreckage of the MH17 airliner that was shot down. But, you know, constant deception about the level of, of Russian forces that were actually present. Whether it's Syria, and you have a military policeman overseeing the, the ruins of, of Aleppo. Um, but again, very much presented as a, a techno war in which Russians are not at, at, at risk and in which they are just simply sort of essentially um, defeating uh, you know, lunatic Islamic terrorists through precision munitions that don't actually end up devastating uh, civilian populations. Or, of course, now the, the conflict in Ukraine, which again being presented as a, a surgical operation against a neo-Nazi regime to stop it from getting nuclear weapons and committing pogroms in, in, in the Donbass. Um, you know, there's, there's a whole variety of ways in which actually, for all the, 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 um, the propaganda and so forth, Clearly, this is a regime that regards itself as vulnerable in terms of the sort of the uh, reliance of its capacity to rely on its people's willingness to accept the role that has been written for them as the ardent supporters of a new militarized national identity. So that's what I want to, to, to end with. I mean, this is this is a, a kind of a work in progress for the Siloviki just, just as for anyone you know, trying to research them. And it's clear, look, the, the Siloviki, they, they do, generally speaking, share a certain sort of baseline worldview, which shouldn't surprise us, to be perfectly honest, if you interviewed, um, you know, American military and intelligence personnel or British ones or whatever, you would likewise find certain views essentially being recognised. In the case of the Russians, yes, it, it comes with a certain degree of, of revanchism, a certain degree of particular sense of vulnerability, but also, you know, that fits what we'd expect to be see of a country that has only relatively recently come to terms with the loss of superpower status and empire and hasn't yet really sort of managed to find a new identity for itself. Nonetheless, the Siloviki are riven with all kinds of factional and other divisions, which often leads to, to very sort of brutal infighting between them. Brutal infighting that actually has in the past, I mean, led to not just arrests, but people being killed. They are subordinated to the president, absolutely. And his constitutional power cannot be challenged. But on the other hand, they have considerable direct and indirect influence on him. So in many ways, the point is he gets to make the decisions, but he gets to make the decisions as framed by those people who brief him. They put a considerable amount of effort into influencing society to try and shape its perceptions of them and of themselves. And the results, frankly, are pretty mixed. They have had some successes, particularly in you know, shaping narratives about the past. The past is safe. No one expects you to go and fight and die for the past. But they also, I would suggest, have failed to shape the sort of national view of Russia's future, of where Russia should be, and perhaps most importantly of all, what costs people are willing to accept in terms of that. I mean, and, and this is this is something that's going to be crucially important in the coming weeks and months and maybe quite possibly years. You know, as the real impact of sanctions bites, as some of the, the disastrous flaws of the military in Ukraine become obvious, as the degree to which the intelligence on which the whole conflict was based becomes comes more and more under question. And we can talk about that in the QA if people want about quite what happened. I mean, my view is. There's a lot of good analysis, but there was bad briefing that people weren't willing to actually tell Putin what he didn't want to hear. Um, you know, but, but as all of these issues kind of come, come to light, you know, it will require Russians to have to, like it or not, engage with this question of their relationship with their own security apparatus. The, 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 the relationship between society, state, and Siloviki, which hasn't yet been resolved. It's been changed and renegotiated through the 1990s and through the Putin era. But nonetheless, you know, the, 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 there is no, no clear resolution. Well, that, that may well come as a result of the war, but obviously we'll have to wait and see about that. So that's me. I've kind of rattled through. I mean, in some ways, I, I, I feel I've sort of moved at rather too quick a speed um, to try and sort of cover a whole variety of issues. And now I'd very much like to, to throw it open for questions, discussion, or indeed furious rebuttals. Mm -hmm.